Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Catch the replay every Saturday and Sunday at 8 a.m. on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7 FM. Stop by and visit us on the web at uprint.life. Bringing you the best local talk radio shows, Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7 FM, WFBT, Carolina Beach. The information on this program is intended to share the experiences others have had in battling addiction and to let you know there is hope to recover, no matter how bad things may seem. Please do not change any program you are on, especially if under medical supervision, without the approval of your doctor, counselor, or other professional treatment. Good evening. Welcome to Recovering Hope. I sure wish we could play more of that song, but that one time we did that, uh, TK, a couple of weeks ago, and at the end we let it run out for about a minute and a half. I got a nasty gram from Facebook. You can't do that. Give me a break. All right, anyway, welcome once again to Recovering Hope. Uh, My name is Mark Markley, and I am here to share with you the fact that there is hope for those struggling with addiction and to offer help, assistance, and resources to them and to their families. So um, thank you for tuning in and, or joining us on Facebook, whatever medium that you are using. Uh, if we could be of any assistance to you, uh, please go to recoveringhope.org. And you can email me there. You can check out that's also the website for our recovery residents called Prodigal Recovery. Um, my phone number, 910-231-6020. Uh, feel free to call any time, but don't expect me to answer between 6 and 7 on Wednesdays. I want to do a quick uh, recap from last week here, and I've got a, I feel like Rush, I, I've got a big stack of stuff here this evening. Um, and, and last week we heard from a gentleman named Kim Humphrey. Uh, Kim is the executive director of an organization called PAL, Parents of Addicted Loved Ones. And uh, this is an organization that, uh, let's see, how many places do they have? They've got a, about 160 groups in 40 different states. And, and the purpose is, as, you, as the name suggests, um, to, to provide um, some comfort and some help and kind of like what I'm doing here uh, for those struggling uh, with addiction and their families. <clears throat> and uh, just real quick, this is... Um, This is a paragraph that I copied off of their website, and and maybe you can identify. To have a child lost to alcohol or drug addiction is to suffer a thousand deaths. The more you try to save them from their addiction, the more it burns a hole in your heart. Watching their light fall away into darkness, you went to your own world of pain. But while you may feel stranded by fear and confusion, you are not alone. There are people out there walking the same path. They are the ones, the only ones, who really understand because they are like you, like Joyce. Joyce has a son named Eric, an educated son with an angelic face and a bright future. Yet by the time he reached his late 20s, Eric was sleeping under an oleander bush behind a grocery store. He was homeless, living on the streets, in and out of jail, and in and out of treatment centers, addicted to opiates. This is why I do what I do, ladies and gentlemen, because my wife and I have had those experiences, and they're horrendous. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. What I do wish on everyone that is experiencing that is the, to know there's hope, to share other stories, get involved in other groups, like PAL. Um, PAL's website is simply palgroup.org, and they are looking for... Uh, to uh, to start up another group, they had one pre-epidemic, uh, but now they're looking to uh, to find somebody that would like to start this. I, I I don't know if it's mandatory, but I think most of the uh, meet in churches. So if you'd be interested in in providing that support, I just got back into a group 
uh, at my church. Uh, it's a similar thing, just a slightly different format, but it's it's parents of addicted loved ones is what it is. It's uh, the, But they have a format. They'll train you and, um, and, and walk you through um, what you'll need to know to perhaps uh, to help others. Uh, can you get Wayne on the line, TK? And uh, Wayne's, uh, I forget where he said he was on his back from, I think Chapel Hill. And since he's on the road, we're going to take advantage of some of that road time. And um, uh, Wayne Ray, if you don't know him, particularly those that are local, uh, Wayne is a licensed clinical addiction specialist as well as a licensed clinical social worker. And let me tell you, I've, I've bragged about this man before, a um, friend of mine, happy to know Wayne. This man hitchhiked here, I think, 35 years ago. And when I tell that story, I also say, how much can you have with you when you're hitching down the road? So basically came to Wilmington with nothing and got himself help, got himself through college, got himself a master's degree, and also um, these other degrees that I just mentioned. So this is not um, an, an insignificant accomplishment. And again, not to mention that he has, I think coming up in a couple of weeks, 25 years clean. Is that right, Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who you been talking to, Mark? Hey, you told hey, me that. That's, that's uh... You you told me that okay, I, yeah. I I put okay. it I put it in my calendar. You know I'm one of those nerds that I write stuff down, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I could give some, you some people say uh, some people will say uh, yeah I'll have uh, x amount of clean time. You know in, in recovery we celebrate our clean time. Um, right. And um, and some people say well yeah God willing I'll have to whatever the number is and I always yell from the back of the room i think he is <laughs> yeah yeah he is are you now i think it's yeah, uh, right. i that's think it's right. june june 29th do i have that right yeah that, that was the day that was the okay. day that okay. i gave up the high cost of low living that's <laughs> very well and said i'm very grateful for a lot of people helped me and uh and i'll, yeah. I'll forever be grateful for yeah. the help and that's when i what... reached out there was a hand there Ready to grab it. Well, exactly. And that's what both of us do, um, you know, uh, in our lives. Um, mine is part-time, yours is full-time, and I'm, I'm happy as you are that, that you can do that. So, um, Wayne, the, the non-medical detox, um, this is something, as, as I'm sure you know, um, is it called a healthy place that's, uh, that's, that's under construction now, but it's going to be a 200-bed home, and I was told it's going to be a non-medical detox. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, you're talking about the healing place. Oh, healing uh, they got place. That's healing it. transitions. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And it's going to be non-medical. Yeah I, yeah, I don't. Right, right. It's um, it's based on just a, a pure social model of, as far as I know, you know, I've I've I've, I've been to the one in Raleigh a couple times. I've, uh huh. Uh, known some people to go there. They um, you know, it's a good place. It's a good place. Mm -hmm. They're trying to help people. Yeah. And, and they do help a lot of people. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that when you say non-medical, yeah. you mean that um, – what, what exactly do you mean, Mark? Well, what do that's mean? what that was my question, really. But I, 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 I put that question as a doctor that I, I spoke to you briefly about on the phone before, uh, Dr. Morse um, in North Carolina. Right. And I, I okay. don't I don't have his okay. notes in front of me, but he operates about eight clinics. And I, I asked him what he knew about that. And this was something that he emailed to me. He said, you know, over the counter meds, no MD, but usually a nurse, Benadryl, antispasmatics, anti nausea uh, drugs, melatonin for sleep, ibuprofen for pain, and then of course some counseling groups, relaxation. And and we'll get maybe uh, the, the the full explanation of that. Um, he's going to be our guest, I think, July seventh um, here. Uh, but uh, Frida McDonald put me in touch with him, and and uh, you know we both know Frida. She's a great resource of information, and and um, yes, she is. Yeah, just looking to learn more about. You know, he has. Um, I, I'll I would say I'll put it on my website. I'll but I'll I'll put it on my Facebook page. Matter of fact, it already is there. Um, a about a half hour YouTube um, uh, clip that he did at at a um, opioid summit 
I think it was just last month. It, it seemed to be very fresh, and it was very well done. Not only is he well spoken, but he also has you know a lot of uh, print material on the screen. You can pause, look at, you know. And I mean, I took a page full of notes. Um, so uh, you know, he does. He's a, a, a firm believer in in uh, medical assisted treatment, aka Matt. Um, and I've learned a lot about that, and look forward to learning more myself. And and the second part of wanting to speak with you, uh, Wayne, here tonight is, um, you know, a lot of people complain that some some institutions, if you will seem as though they put people on too high of a dose, perhaps methadone and suboxone, but for all practical purposes, we'll just talk about the suboxone and the buprenorphine. And, and I'm curious how that works once they come off of it, because, you know, people that don't know, buprenorphine is a drug that you can, uh, p- people can take to help reduce the cravings and or the effects of opiates. Uh, do I have that pretty clear in a you know, abbreviated for yes. Wayne, right? And and yes. and I've spoken to people that are on as much as 24 milligrams a day. And it would take, I mean, if you're going to do it right without getting very sick, I think it would take several years to taper off of that. Give us a little more accurate information on that, if you can, Wayne. Yeah, um... Yeah, a lot has changed um, in the world since the opioid epidemic uh, showed up and, and our, started happening in our country probably as, as far back as that I can remember. is like 2007. Mm-hmm. Um, things started really, you know, people started dying more than we had ever seen before, and it's just been escalating. And this year we're on, our country's on track to just break records again. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, with how many people have passed away. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure a lot of your shows have, you know, have talked about that and will continue to talk about it. Yeah. Um, but those two drugs, the three drugs that that I recommend, and in the recovery house world, we call it medically assisted recovery. Mm-hmm. We don't use the word treatment, but okay. there is treatment. Mm-hmm. And whatever how you look at it, and the words are sometimes words are, are powerful in the semantics, but Mm-hmm. So you have uh, Vivitrol, which is is um, not no o- no opioids in in that medicine at right, all. Right, right. Okay. Then you have, and that that's the brand name for n- naltrexone. Right. Then you have um, um, uh, you have Suboxone, which has um, um, buprenorphine is one of the mm-hmm. things in it, as as well as I think. Naloxone and then keep you your keep methadone. your eyes on the road now. So <laughs> yeah, I am, and I'm almost uh, where I can pull over. Okay, but um, but Subox- um, methadone is probably the most kind of invasive, and people it has a bad name early on. Yeah, uh, it, it takes the doctor a while sometimes to get the dose right. Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody's metabolism is different. Mm-hmm. So, and then you have the the person that's the patient. You know, they have their input, and, and you know, you just, nowadays we just give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. If they say they need more. Yeah, they say they know, have pain. A lot pain. of times it's yeah. the patient saying they don't feel right or whatever, mm-hmm. and the doctor is going along with whatever the patient tells them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in this world, we just have to take their word for it. I right. mean, I, um, and... You know, if they want to come down off of it, titrate off of, uh, uh, that's up to them and the doctor. You know, I'm a, I do have an LCAS, like you said. Mm-hmm. I'm a licensed clinical addiction specialist, which is mm-hmm. a, a master's level, but I'm not mm-hmm. an MD. Right. And right. we just, we always, you know, we don't try to play doctor. And, and, yeah. and if between, and every now and then you'll find maybe an unscrupulous place that will, Maybe keep somebody on longer mm-hmm. than they should be, but uh-huh. I, I can't. I can't let my mind go there. If that happens, then yeah, it's a well. case by case situation. There's too many people dying that don't have access to any of this mm-hmm. medication that would at least keep them alive yeah. long enough, hopefully, to fall in love with recovery. And one day, right. maybe they would wouldn't have to get that medicine. Yeah, I feel bad for for them having to go take the medicine every day but it does keep them alive yeah and so that's the most important thing right no it is it is and i 
but I think also long term, you know, there's damage that gets done. I think bone density is affected with long term buprenorphine consumption. I don't know about the methadone, but the one thing that Dr. Moore said in this in this YouTube uh, talk uh, is that one of the benefits of the morphine is, I mean, some people, of course, have legitimate pain and they're trying to deal with the pain. They're not just, you know, trying to see how they can get high legally. And, and evidently, the, um, the methadone does, does help to some degree with pain. But I would say either, either of those drugs, with their proper medical attention, fine. But there, there was one doctor in town that, that my son was going to. Um, I really feel like mentioning his name, but um, I remember Tom Goolsby telling me, you know, I asked him years ago if I can say things on the radio. He says, as long as it's true, they can't sue you. So anyway, um, but this doctor was charging $300 cash and then you would get your prescription for your suboxone now why i could understand not taking a check from somebody that's that's you know trying to come off of heroin or other opiates but why not a credit card you know where's that cash going we all know where it's going it's going in his pocket and to do this again and again and again it you know it was i guess instead of a pill mill it's a suboxone mill so that's that's what uh, gets me angry and concerned and 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 again too long, uh, you know, staying on these, these, um, uh, is it, is an antagonist the proper word? Uh, it, it can do damage, you know, to, to your health. It's not, it's not good for your health. So, yeah, it's, uh, some of us look at that, uh, that probably is true. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't tell you, I've not done any research and I can't, uh, I've heard, heard that, but I, I don't definitely know that it's true. Yeah. I think the world of addiction is uh, is probably if somebody wants to be a researcher, there is an, a never-ending, you know, amount of research that n needs to be done in oh, this yeah. space. If that if that's true, it may there's a lot of drugs. Um, I take metformin for my diabetes. There's, mm -hmm. prob, there's a lot of uh, schools of thought that that has some long-term effects. Uh -huh. All I know is right now where we're at in this country. Yeah, you know. They're dying at such a high rate, Mark. Yeah. It's coming across the border. It's coming yeah. um, in, in such kind of velocity. It's in everything. It, it's in cocaine. It's in uh, meth. It's in. They're putting it. Uh, they're cooking it up with crack. I don't know why. Why in the world anybody yeah. would ever do that? But that's what I understand. That they're they're doing the lab test and finding that fentanyl is in pretty much everything. And until that changes, mm. and I don't know how it's going to change, yeah. but I am all for uh, medically assisted recovery. Absence based mm. to me is the gold standard. It should be right. the gold. I mean, for, for me and a lot of people I know, that's right. our, you know, our approach. And it's a lot less invasive to mm. us, our bodies, our future, our families, mm -hmm. uh, our time, and our money. It, it's just, it's free. It's, you know, it's, um, you don't have to deal with any doctors that you may think are, uh, you know, not don't have your best interest. Most doctors yeah. do have your best interest. Yeah. Um, most of them do. I would say 99 point something percent. But as we know from our friend Dan Schneider and mm -hmm. the pharmacists, you know, yeah. every, you know, they are um, there are a few of them that that I don't think, you know, whatever they needed to happen to them. Yeah. But I, I wonder. Um, I was watching television the other night, and they were talking about the people coming across the border, just yeah. how much uh, fentanyl they had seized and how oh, many yeah. people from how many different countries. Mm -hmm. And what struck me was they were saying the cartels bring people over to this point and drop them off. They kept using the word cartel. Mm. I'm like, so cartels are bringing people to the border and helping them get across. Well, a cartel is, when you hear the word cartel, you're like, uh, what's the next thing you think about? The word cartel What's the very next thing you think about? El Chapo. Drugs. Cartel. <laughs> well, I, I think about drugs. Right. Cartel drugs. drugs. Yeah. yeah. So the very people that are getting the people to the border are the same organizations that are distributing a lot of the quantities of drugs, yeah. Yeah. you know, smuggling them in our country. So it's yeah. the same people. Well, the, so anyway, uh, I, I hope that our country would do a better job of you know, keeping at least the southern border. I don't yeah. know. It's so frustrating seeing the young people just, you know, just one after another just yeah. pass away. I know, and I don't know. So, you may you may have seen these same numbers, Wayne, but I've seen it in a couple of different places, not just the same article, the same organization, but the 
increase in fentanyl coming over the border last month as opposed to the same time last year was about 257 percent more. And as I've said this every time I mention that stat, 2 percent more would be too, too much. But 250 right. I mean, my God, that's, that's incalculable, the damage that they can do. But, but when you mentioned fentanyl, they're putting in everything. I just saw something from a, a, a good source last week. 150 pounds of uh, pot was seized, I think, in Pennsylvania with fentanyl in it. So, you know, uh, and, and I think that the, the, the main reason for doing that, you know, these drug dealers are not wanting to kill these people because they don't make good customers, but it does get them hooked on their product, and they have to go back for more. So, But, um, yep. Wayne, thanks for your time, buddy. I really do appreciate Oh, one more quick question on the fentanyl. Um, and I think I've had addressed this before with others. Um, because it's so much stronger than, than heroin, is, is Narcan still effective with it, do you know? Yeah. You, 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 it, the way I've witnessed it, it takes more than just one dose of Narcan. Okay. So if, you're, if you have a, a person with uh, you know, any history of, of opioid addiction in your mm -hmm. house, you should you know, have about five hits if you can afford it and you can get a hold of it. Right. They have it at the harm reduction place over on um, at the corner of Kent and um, Wrightsville. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, right where they come together. Yep, yep. Um, you can pick. They're open in the afternoons. You can pick up some Narcan there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, keep at least five hits because it might mm -hmm. take that much. Yeah. All right, bud. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you face to face one of these days. And drive okay, safe, Mark. Thanks for all that you're doing. All thanks, right, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, bye. That's our friend Wayne Ray of Launchpad Wellness, uh, one of the area's um, most comprehensive uh, recovery resources in southeastern North Carolina and Myrtle Beach. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get uh, Cynthia on the line, and I think that might be happening um, as we speak. So we'll be right back. Don't go away. <laughs> Besides my involvement in product recovery, I'm also in the construction business. I say that to say this. When we have tropical storms or hurricanes, the real hard, difficult, expensive, and dangerous work is usually the result of trees falling on homes or other personal property. Hurricane season is not the only time to get prepared for this. As a matter of fact, it's before and after hurricane season that you need to get prepared. My son Chris started his tree business called Climb Pro Expert Tree Care after Hurricane Florence. Chris has all the equipment and manpower to take on even the most challenging jobs. With over 20 years of combined experience, Climb Pro LLC can safely remove any unwanted hazardous trees from your property. They also offer tree pruning, elevation, deadwood removal, and other expert tree care services. Don't wait until you have a tree emergency. Visit ClimbPro.com, that's Climb with a K. Check them out on Facebook or call Chris Markley at 910-540-5249. Mention this ad for a 10% discount. Constructive Solutions is the name of my construction company. It's called Constructive Solutions because I focus on solving what it is my customers need and want, and there's always a way to get the job done. We're in our 25th year serving our community. We handle all types of home improvements and repairs, literally from your crawl space to your roof, as well as commercial alterations. We're a small, family-owned and operated business. My wife works in the office, and my son Dylan is my right and left-hand man. Combined, we have over 70 years of experience. Dylan and I face every project or challenge that comes our way. I learned my trade from my father, who was a builder, until his eyesight failed him. I was showing some employees a picture of my father working on the second story eaves of his home, and I said, can you believe he's 82 and up on a homemade scaffold? They said, he's 82. I replied, yes, and he's blind. Don't ever tell me it can't be done. So if you want quality, professional service for your home or business, give us a call at 910 231 6020 or go to markmarkley.com. And good evening. Welcome back to Recovering Hope. My name is Mark Markley. Pleasure to be here with you again this, this fine Wednesday evening in the Port City. 
If we can be of any service to you, please um, don't hesitate to ask. Log on to recoveringhope.org. And I remember my webmaster, Yael, telling me to remind people that they can watch on YouTube and and something else and something else. I don't know. I, I just used to do plain old radio years ago, but now it's, it's taken a whole nother level. So please, if we can be of any assistance, you've got something to share. Perhaps you have a story of, of hope or recovery or, or you have a problem that you'd like to maybe get pointed in the right direction. Unlike my friend Wayne, I don't have those initials after my name, uh, but I, I know how to find uh, people some some good solutions to problems if they have them. My number, 231-6020. And do we have Cynthia on the line? Hello. Hello, Cynthia. <laughs> Hello. How, how are you? I am fine. We've had a very busy day today, and I'm looking forward to discussing it. I know you did, and me, I want to jump right in. Now, today was um, uh, the hearing, another hearing on the Purdue Farm. Actually, Let's back up a little bit. Sure. Why don't you introduce yourself <laughs> and uh, give us a little background, and then we'll jump into the into the numbers. And, folks, you might want to keep a pencil and paper handy, write some of this stuff down. There might be some action. We hope there is action that you can take to help uh, resolve one of the biggest issues facing drug addiction. So go ahead, Cynthia. Thank you. Well, my name is Cynthia Munger, and I'm a member of – our community, I'm a proud mom of a son who was prescribed OxyContin after his shoulder surgery mm-hmm. and didn't take long to learn that if you keep popping pills, you get to pitch until the arm falls off. So mm. it's a very common story, mm-hmm. and I'm happy to say he is very much in recovery. He is rebuilding his life, and I couldn't be prouder. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and that's really how I got into it. Mm-hmm. And I spent the past 10 years devoting myself mm-hmm. to bringing accountable to justice. Yeah. So he was, uh, would you say he was over, over-prescribed the medication or just the false claims that this medication was harmless and, and only 1% get addicted? Well, I'd say both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the first, the first uh, prescription, I will say his surgeon was, was very good mm-hmm. and found ways to minimize the prescriptions after we talked about it. But basically, mm-hmm. he had, I gave him his first OxyContin mm-hmm. after the surgery. And, mm-hmm. and the first thing I found out, I realized, is that very soon, every afternoon, he was held up. He was held up very, uh, for a long time with his, his shoulder. Mm-hmm. And we'd see that midday to the three-quarters of the way through, he acted like he was getting the flu, and I mm. had no clue that he was one of the few that that have early withdrawal. Oh, the mm. oxycontin claim that you get twelve hours, right? But by hour eight, he was miserable. Wow! And yeah, so there are all kinds of things that happen mm. that we have over the years, and that have, I think have very much contributed. And so many became dependent and then totally addicted. And did that happen to, uh, with the first pill that he took, the first OxyContin? No, I'd say it started happening about the third or fourth day. Third or fourth I day, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, he was taking them round the clock. Uh, and, well, round the clock, every 12 hours, right. but it was around the clock. Uh, okay. And, yeah, he just, he had, he had no tolerance or or. Alternatively, I guess he had very much tolerance for mm-hmm. the pills, and they would very quickly. Mm. And he was a strong kid. But I've talked to so many athletes and yeah. people that have been prescribed these pills. Mm-hmm. Uh, I called the anesthesiologist, and I said, what's the story here? This is pretty strong. Mm. Isn't it? He goes, no, oh, you can't get addicted. You have to take it for 21 straight days at full capacity to even get dependent. Oh, wow. I Honestly, was told that mm. this is 2008. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so. how many was he addicted for for years, uh, Cynthia? Or how long did this last? I'd say we went back and forth. Uh, he went to college, and mm-hmm. it got worse. Mm-hmm. Just, we went back and forth for maybe six years. Okay. There'd be a good times for almost a year, and then 
it, it, you know, it's unpredictable. Yes, it is very. And it's very difficult to, as a mom, put your finger on how did this happen? Why is it happening? Mm. When was it good? When was it bad? Yeah. And I've learned a lot over the past decade, I can tell you. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> Okay, so with that background now, so you began pursuing or investigating um, where did this come from, how does this happen, and how do we stop it, I guess? Yeah, really, I wanted to know what was going on. I had, and back then, I mean, people are so much more sophisticated than everything today. Hmm. And I knew nothing. And yet I was always somebody that conducted research my career with very much in uh, analysis and research and uh, mm -hmm. hoard information. And I just thought I have to learn as much about this as I could. Right. And I had never heard the Sackler name, mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. that owns Purdue Pharma. I had not heard of Purdue Pharma. I made the classic mistake everybody does. Mm -hmm. Chicken people, they make pills. You know? Right, right. And it was just eye-opening and mm -hmm. I have thousands of pages of research and online research that I've wow. accumulated of research. Mm. and I learned everything I could about the Sacklers mm -hmm. I yeah. wanted to know how they thought and how they could do this mm -hmm. so and what did you find out just maybe a, a summary of well, that and then we'll get into some more details okay fine I found out that the three founders uh, the three founders were neuro, they were uh, doctors who mm -hmm. specialized in neurosciences. They had acquired Purdue Pharma in the 50s, and it, the three founders' names were Arthur, who was the older brother, mm -hmm. Raymond, and Mortimer. Mm -hmm. And these three knew from their work and their background and their expertise mm -hmm. what opioids do to the system. They created... Uh, in the 80s, a product called MS Cotton, and it was manufactured and produced out of the UK, one of their their locations. Mm -hmm. And MS Cotton was the morphine base, and they decided that what would be very helpful would, would be to manufacture to create a pill-based oxycodone opioid-based mm. product. The lie that came out of it is that when it was put out there in 1995, physicians, medical journals, they claimed it in studies. They claimed, they gave, I'll take that back, they gave the insinuation without disclaiming that this drug was, was less powerful than morphine. It was much more powerful. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, today, and so think of it back then. We were at a time when, you know, you would go in and you would have a bad surgery and you would be on a morphine pump mm -hmm. that was red, and you'd have nurses coming in every, every day. Right. They morphed that into a product that was probably twice as strong, depending how it's ingested, mm -hmm. that is given in a prescription and the person walks away with 180 pills. Wow. Think about it, and it all went through the FDA. And what was the and what was the uh, the trade name or the the drug name of that first Oxycontin. one? That was OxyContin. Oh, the first one, OxyContin was the Purdue Pharma. And that's Purdue's that's pill. the one that's stronger than morphine. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, just the way it was chemically formulated, I'm certainly not qualified to speak to that. Right. That's okay. But the family was very prolific. They patented everything, mm. and they made a they made a fortune. They made thirty six billion. Wow! Out of Pharma on that one product. Oh wow! Yeah, it was it was it's pretty dramatic. And mm. where do you go? Where, I mean, it was an incredible amount of money in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And they just flooded the market with it, and controlled mm. the market. Right. And the rest is kind of history. Now we're stuck with fentanyl <laughs> and yeah. all the other drugs. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So they, you know, they sent out the, the reps to the doctor's office, 
um, you know, whining and dining the doctors and, you know, just, just prescribe this. And I remember seeing something, um, I forget who it was, uh, their advertising agency. Um, I can't think of the name. I'm sure you know who it is. But they were able to actually put in the literature that less than 1% of people that take this become addicted. That was a, that was a really big boost for their sales, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That mm. was put in there, and, the, and that was tied to the extended relief. That's there was right. A, they basically said that, you know, it's apparent, it, somehow they worded it. I don't, I could look it up, but yeah. it's worded such that mm -hmm. it basically says extended relief, you don't get high off of it. You yeah. don't have a problem with it. It's not addictive. Mm. And let's one percent would ever get addicted by it and mm -hmm. that was completely bogus and mm -hmm. again they knew it oh, they yeah. knew all of it. oh yeah and i do believe that in some of these i, I think it's in, in recent uh hearings um that they admitted to this did they not but, but oh yeah <laughs> and, but oh yeah but it, it's it's like so many other things i was just talking to my one of my sons about this today all of these political garbage that's going on, you know, way back, you know, when, when Hillary was running. And again, I'm not turning this into a political show, but, you know, there was things that, that people did. There, there was, you know, the bleach bit, the, you know, James Comey and, and, and all this stuff. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's going down. You know, this, this crazy election. I don't know which side of the aisle that you're on, and I don't care. But this, this election was, was this, let's say, irregular nobody is going down the, the, and 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 with the stuff with the sacklers it, it it's well uh, i know the answer it's the almighty dollar that's it's it the almighty dollar it's the one percent who actually rules yeah. and they don't pay taxes mm. they get away with whatever they want mm -hmm. and they control congress they and mm -hmm. even politicians that come in that want to do the right thing mm. as recently when Maloney tried to, to introduce the Sackler Act, which would take away a lot of judges' power uh, mm -hmm. in bankruptcy, and mm -hmm. hopefully for some of the things we'll get into, uh, it was all political. Yeah. It was, there wasn't, an, you lose the issue mm -hmm. in machinations, and they all end up going back to the almighty donor dollar. Yes. Now, and I, th I think you said that there was a hearing today and that you yes. were going to try to tune into as much of that as you can. Was, were there any, any new developments? Or, or do you want to give us the, um, uh, some of the facts about the lawsuit, uh, Cynthia? And, and folks, where you've tuned into Recovering Hope. I'm speaking with Cynthia Munger, uh, who has um, done a lot of investigating in the past 10 or, or more years on Purdue Farmer and, and what's going on with them. So, Cynthia, um, when was the lawsuit, uh, when did that begin? And what has happened, again, maybe, you know, somewhat of a brief summary since the, since the suit began and where we are literally today? Okay. Uh, first of all, what's going on right now is the Purdue bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And bankruptcies are bankruptcies. You claim you don't have enough enough to keep in business they are going to go out of business and mm -hmm. then the judge gets involved and everybody fights over the the assets that are left and everyone gets their pennies on the dollar right and so that doesn't change except it's very big and it's very complex mm -hmm. now there have been two actual i would say watershed lawsuit cases mm -hmm. that have to do with purdue and the sackler family and both times they wiggled out of it without any accountability. Wow. And there is evidence and there are leaked documents. In 2007, it was a 120-page indictment memo that had them nailed to the wall. And wow. that Rudy Giuliani went in and was able to get, uh, I think it was Ascoff at the time, was, was turned, uh, attorney, uh, attorney general. general. So but that regardless, was in, that was in 2007, 14 years ago. They paid $600 million. Their felonies 
were uh, brought down to misdemeanors and the executives did not go to jail. That was the beginning uh-huh. of the end. Uh-huh. If you don't put an executive or an accountable person mm-hmm. in jail, mm-hmm. nothing. And one of the things they did in that case, and we'll get, that I just want to mention is mm. Medicare and Medicaid is a huge buyer of drugs, obviously. Right. The Department of Justice agreed to let the Sackler family, let Purdue Pharma, be sued as one of its entities, Purdue Pharma LP, so that they could keep, even though they were they were guilty, they could keep their contracts, which are normally one of the biggest penalties that are removed and mm. acts that serve as a means of preventing people from doing the bad deeds. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we had 220, which was just last year, and that was a case um, that the Department of Justice made a deal with the bankruptcy mm-hmm. and with Judge Court. And in that deal, they basically said, "You, we, we want to see this deal go through. We want to see the, uh, the disclosure and the settlements to be negotiated. And if that's in the case, although we have jurisdiction and first rights, to go after Purdue and the Sacklers for $18 billion. Mm. We'll only find $225 million. Wow. We'll hold this over your head. So just remember that, everybody. Mm. And that's how we started. That's how we started. It was uh, the bankruptcy. First of all, Mark, the bankruptcy should never, it, it, it should never have happened. Mm-hmm. Purdue Farm had virtually no debt right. and was healthy as all get out. Mm-hmm. They were given bankruptcy on the basis of they think that the number of lawsuits will bring them down. Uh-huh. And then they proceeded to spend the rest of the time telling everybody they weren't guilty of anything. And they would win if they ever were sued. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, there's... They Something smells there. So I think you had yeah. said that, you know, as a result of their their um, introduction of OxyContin, they made, what did you say, $36 billion? Yes, $36 billion was generated, I believe, like, probably from around 1996. And I'm probably quoting numbers that would probably have stopped around 2017 okay. when... The- went into a restructuring. And they, they claimed um, that these lawsuits were going to bring them down, so they filed a bankruptcy, and right. and the one amount that was awarded was $226 million, did you say? No, that was to deal with the Department of Justice. It's very oh, complicated. It is, and I'm it's trying to, yeah, I'm trying to uncomplicate it, but I'm probably making it worse. I know. <laughs> and I'm, no, 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 you're not. And I'm trying to, because it's, uh, I've never seen anything so convoluted as this. Yeah. But basically, the Department of Justice went after them on completely different issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, law, then made a deal. We won't mess up your bankruptcy. And we will not go after you for the full amount that we are, we are able to collect under your broke, you're breaking the law. Mm-hmm. Instead. You give us $225 million and we'll go away as long as this bankruptcy is going to go through. Uh huh. Legally, they call it a poison pill. Basically, mm-hmm. if you don't do what I said, take a poison pill. Yeah. But, but, and so that's where we really are now. And mm-hmm. I have said today's hearing was a solid five and a half hours with no break. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is what it's been like. And I, you know, the question is why would it be that way? And I think the biggest problem is that we never should be in this bankruptcy. We shouldn't be in a bankruptcy right, at all. Right. The bankruptcy court doesn't facilitate the right and wrong environment and the right and wrong jurisdictions that mm. the public wants. Yeah. 
it's making Purdue happy, Sacklers happy, executives happy, mm-hmm. the lawyers feel the lawyers are making a fortune. Oh yeah. And the people, Mark, they're just they've been discarded and marginalized. It's I I think horrible. I think you had said that there was perhaps something new that was being introduced today. Um yes. I forget how you referred to it when we spoke uh, a couple days yeah. ago. Do, yeah. you, do you know uh, if, that, if that was received or introduced? First, it was, I'll tell you, we were kind of celebrating, uh, and I'll say sort of because mm. I'll, I'll explain why. But basically, uh, what happened was during the, this process, there have, I mean, I'd say there's been three things that we've been trying to accomplish. One, we've been trying to fight the bankruptcy releases that the Sackler family are getting. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll get back to, we can go back to that. And two, uh, we've been trying to fight in court various areas that would promote the position of the individual claimant and the public. And we've tried to stop the incorrect and misinformation that's out there. Mm -hmm. And a big one is we've been trying to get an objective examiner. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens today. Okay. An examiner is someone that is brought in from the outside. Judge Drain can't stand them because they interfere with his, his decisions and complete power. Yeah. The lawyers can't stand it because it forces the truth in many instances. Mm-hmm. And right now, the truth is not something that anybody wants out. And that's my personal opinion, and I believe it sincerely, and I think I can substantiate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cindy, I don't know if you're, if you're moving your phone around. I'm, you're, you're kind of going in and out a little bit. If you could try oh, and sorry. think of it as a microphone, and if you could keep it right in front of your mouth, I think it would, I'm having a, I don't know if that's the issue or if it's a bad connection. Um, so... What did you okay. call this person that they're that they're trying to bring in? Called an examiner. An examiner, okay. It's an objective person that comes from the outside mm-hmm. that basically just reviews what people are doing. That's the simplest way to put it. And okay. Jonathan, a professor from Temple in bankruptcy law, a I think a brilliant person. He today was and today was a little wild, Mark, because uh-huh. he stood up. He stood up to Judge Drain. And went toe to toe with him. And mm-hmm. Judge Drain had temper tantrums. It was the worst case of oh, wow. bullying hmm. misbehavior I've ever seen. Hmm. But, but Jonathan Lipson was able to get it. Oh, this good. is probably the first he got the examiner. Now it's on a very limited basis, mm-hmm. and they're not allowed to look at a whole lot. But hmm. it is a break for us. Okay, good. And somewhat of a help. Mm hmm. Okay, so action plan. Is it time to talk about what uh, what we, Johnny and Jeannie, public can do here? Yes, I'd be more than yeah, I'd love to. Okay. One of the one of the things that we need to do as a public mm-hmm. is keep the pressure on Judge Dream's court. Mm-hmm. Keep the public informed, and we've created a um, website. Mm-hmm. We I mean, it's really been created by an organization called Payne that is run by Nan Golden, who is an incredible advocate uh-huh. on behalf of the people. And uh, she's always in the forefront of going after the opioid. And what, what's his name again, Cynthia? It's her name, Nan oh. Golden, G-O-L-D-I-N. She's an uh, she's an, uh Famous artist. I didn't know it. Uh-huh. It was always it was always very interesting because all these people say, You know Nan Golden and I <laughs> said, Are you famous? And she, <laughs> she hmm. laughed. But she's wonderful. She's done a great job. And she started an and, organization the acronym is Pain? Yes. Okay. And yes. And hmm. they built a website called Oxyjustice dot org. Yes, I've heard Ed mention that. Mm-hmm. Right. And recently, in fact, just the past few days, we have uh, put up a request for people to write Judge Drain and let Judge Drain know 
how you feel about the claims, the uh, and I'm going to tell you, the money that's being distributed, the claimants are getting the short end of the stick. Mm-hmm. When other groups that are that are claim claimants and creditors get billions, mm. they're getting between seven hundred and seven hundred and fifty million divided mm. among oh a hundred thousand people in categories over four years. Oh wow! How do you spell Dra- how do you spell Judge Drain's last name? Like. The, D, just like the drain. Okay, D R A I N. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Now you say right to Judge Drain. Um, do you think that? And this sounds perhaps pessimistic, but do you think that he actually will get these letters? I I would probably electronically, but do do you see that that makes a difference? Yes, and I'll tell okay. you why. Okay. Good. We did it one day, and I have right here. I was so excited. A Judge Drain actually responded to someone they wrote yesterday. Uh-huh, good. And, and he was his regular self, mm-hmm. kind of test. Mm-hmm. And she wrote, a, she lost her son. She wrote a beautiful letter. And in fact, his response uh, basically chastised her. And, huh. uh, yeah, and I, would you like me to read it? Do we, you have two minutes for me to read the response? This yeah, go ahead. Judge Drain. Go ahead. Okay. After she wrote her story and how she was unhappy with the way that she could claim it, with mm-hmm. the way that it was, he wrote back. I want to assure you that notwithstanding what you may have read in the press, Judge Drain cannot stand the press. Mm-hmm. I, have made, I have not made a decision to confirm produce Chapter 11 plan. That's true. That happens in August. But he did approve a 600-page disclosure statement, which outlines everything. So mm. it was a play on this. I've made a decision to let the plan be voted on by holders of claims and to let Purdue seek confirmation of the plan. Now, the votes are not even. The uh, individual claimants are getting a lesser amount of votes relative to the more powerful groups like the state. Mm. It's not a fair voting. But that, of course, is not here, he said. Purdue's request for confirmation of the plan is not to be heard until later this summer and thus won't be decided by me one way or another until after the hearing. Mm-hmm. And, he, and basically, he, uh, he goes on to say uh, that, that finally you may have gotten the, the impression from certain press accounts that if produced Chapter 11 plan is confirmed, it will not only release third parties from civil liability. Now, third pa- parties mean the Purdue fam- the Sackler family and mm-hmm. all of their, their relatives, their associates, their lawyers, their friends. Mm. About 300 releases have been approved in this disclosure. Wow. He goes on to say to her that clearly this is not true. It, the release is in the plan if the plan is confirmed. He goes, one, will not cover criminal liability. Mm-hmm. And that, and you know, here's again the play on words. And this is where the public is being misled. And this is why we have to write in and say you're not fooling us. Mm-hmm. Because basically there's the legal reality and there's the real reality. Now the legal reality is, yes. Absolutely. Criminal liability is not part of the bankruptcy civil procedure. Mm -hmm. Nobody, not any of the states, are ever going to sue the Sacklers because they're getting $4.5 billion paid out over, we think, somewhere around seven to nine years. Mm. If any one of those states, which is where, or the the Department of Justice, who has already agreed not to get involved, then the Sacklers immediately stop paying out and the states won't get their money. So despite the fact the states work really, really hard to get a settlement so that they can put it towards abatement, mm-hmm. if they turn around and then say, okay, now I'm going to hold you criminally liable for all the awful things you've done to bring closure to the people, mm-hmm. they lose the money. Wow. It's, yeah, you're so right. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. It is 
it is very complicated, but to see all the public here is what he's writing. Mm. I can tell you there's about four or five what I would call misperceptions of information mm-hmm. in this report. So how do but, we how do we write the judge? I would like to get that clear, and maybe there's a couple of other actions that we can take. Okay, fine. Uh, the best way to write the, the write the judge when you go on oxyjustice.org. Okay. There, there's a button that says write Judge Drain. That's pretty easy. <laughs> okay. It's pretty, yeah, it's my kind of, of instruction. Yeah, mine too. You, you hit that button, it will take you to a paragraph that describes why, and then it gives you his email, mm-hmm. it gives you the address them, his full name, mm-hmm. his address, everything you need mm. for the letter. All you have to do is say what you want. Okay. And frankly, I would say there's a lot of things people should be complaining about in this bankruptcy. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, briefly, just to help people understand and put it in context, Mm -hmm. I can, you know, I look at the Sacklers are getting full, full immunity Mm. for any, any type of civil liability. And mm. I'll give you the language real quick. The release party shall be conclusively, absolutely, unconditionally, irrevocably, forever, and permanently released. Wow. That's actually in a legal document. And that's, that's only a small bit of about 11 pages of it. Wow. It, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Wow. And they're basically saying, you can never blame me for what I did in the past. Mm. And you can't blame me for what I've done. I might, I'm probably going to do in the future because yeah. I've already done it twice and gotten away with it. Wow. People should be angry and I want them to oh, know. There, there are go, plenty. Uh, there are plenty of very, very angry people, especially uh, those who have lost a loved one uh, absolutely. Due, due to this drug pandemic. So oxyjustice.org, um, I would imagine right. other than writing Judge Drain, there are other action steps that uh, can be yeah. taken. Yes, thank you. Okay. And uh, on the same website, mm-hmm. there is a petition that is done completely for you. All you have to do is sign it. Okay. That, that will petition the representative in that person's state, and the system looks up for you who it okay. is. You just okay. got to give an address, a whip out who you speak, and they'll create the format of the letter, and you can edit if you want or just send it as it is. Okay, you that's hit a good. Button, good. And Boom. Yeah, you yeah. are complaining to the your representative as well as to Judge Drain. Those are the two most important places and, to go. And what's the time frame here, um, Cynthia? I mean, oh, I know right. time is of the essence, but do we see an end to this um, madness, yeah. or is this just going to be something that's going to drag on for quite some time? No, Judge Drain has made it perfectly clear that he is seeking and he probably is going to get because he's shoving through uh, decisions and time frames okay. that in all of this year, okay, they will have a confirmation here all right. and it will be decided one way or the other. All right. Well, in the meantime, we have some work to do and I'm sorry, we got to close it out now, but uh, Cynthia, thank you so much. You've, you've been very good. Um, some great information here. Thank you for all you and so many others do. And just as a reminder, please go to oxyjustice.org. There is a button, right, Judge Drain. Um, tell him whatever you want, folks. Keep it clean and respectful. But um, And there's also a petition that can be signed, and I'm sure a, a lot more. And once again, thank you, uh, Cynthia, for, for all your hard work. And I love that dog video. We didn't get to talk about that, but maybe next time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. All right. All right. You take care. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. All right. Just real quick, folks. Got about 30 seconds left, I think. Uh, Next week, we're going to be speaking with a a local businesswoman uh, who I think has at least 15 years clean, and she's done quite well in business. So we'll hear part of her story next week. Thank you for tuning in. You take care. Remember, if I can be of any assistance, recoveringhope.org. Just let me know. God bless and good night.
This is for those who always show they care, who told their kids everyone 12 and older is eligible for a COVID vaccine, those who explained to their cousins that vaccines prevent nearly 100% of hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19. This is for the ones protecting those they love. Thank you. 